Marlene and Mariana, uh, what they shared with us are various examples of uh, microaggressions. As Marilyn said, it's no longer a struggle of fighting for that seat in the classroom, but fighting for that recognition, fighting to not be invisible in some cases, fighting to, but also fighting the stigmas that make you hyper-visible in the, in the institution. And that hypervisibility is used to police students to regulate their integration into UT, into the classroom, into the groups that we have created, um, or used to exclude students as well. Um, so just to define the term microaggressions, um, according to Tarayoso, these are ongoing racialized and gendered incidents questioning students' academic merit, cultural knowledge, and physical presence. Microaggressions are hard to pinpoint. They're very hard to talk about. These are very nuanced interactions that when they happen, we are extremely confused. We don't even know how to react. And talking about it is extremely hard. And it, what makes it harder is that it doesn't happen just along racial lines. It happens along the intersection of race with gender, with ability, with sexuality, with class, etc. So all these stories are not neat. They're very, very messy. And hopefully with the conversation we're having today, we will achieve some kind of understanding about it. Um, just to go back to microaggressions, these are used to reposition students into subordinate um, positions to deal with the anxiety caused by the presence of students, students that do not uh, embody that normativity, who do not embody whiteness or um, maleness or middle class values, etc. Well, they can happen, um, they happen all the time, they're very pervasive, and they can even happen when people have good intentions. So even when a space is created on campus to supposedly support students, um, all these hierarchies and logics that we have come to rely on are reproduced within this very um, organizations. And like I said earlier, they used to either make students invisible or hyper-visible. Uh, one way that students are made invisible is through curriculum, and I'm talking about curriculum broadly conceived as both what is taught and the manner in which it is taught. So if a professor designs a classroom that only has one chapter on the history of Native Americans, African Americans, Mexican Americans, and only told from the point of view of white people, you know, that is a way to make students of color in the classroom feel invisible, feel marginalized. Um, at the same time, if a professor comes into class and starts blurting out jokes about how they are so rich, or how women are taking over, you know, UT, or anything ridiculous, uh, these are also examples of how students within the classroom can feel very marginalized and disconnected from the professors. The other aspect of microaggressions I wanted to talk about is the hypervisibility of students of color or queer students or anyone who does not embody that white male middle class ideal of the university. Uh, by pointing out the deviance of students, if you point out someone's accent or if you question their citizenship status, if you joke about a woman's um, intelligence in engineering classes, for example, uh, this may not sound to some people like great grievances, but they add up and they take a huge toll on the students. And in my own research, I have seen how students can drop out of classes, uh, drop out of school, change majors, just seek help from outside the institution, which is supposed to be a state institution, representative of all of us. Um, and in those cases, UT, TAs, professors, even ourselves as peers, fail everyone. 